Native people have never lost our connection to the land, to the water. Many of us live in community with our mother as a practice, not in theory. We're the last holders of the sacred places all over Mother Earth. Despite this, our voices are almost entirely absent from the table of solving climate crisis. Enbridge's Line 3 is one of the dirtiest fossil fuels pipelines. It would be one of the largest tar sands oil pipelines in the world, carrying up to 915,000 barrels a day of tar sands through our sacred wild rice beds, through our territory, through the, to the shore of Lake Superior, through the Mississippi headwaters. So First Nations, tribal communities, environmental groups, communities across the Great Lakes region have been fighting for over seven years to stop this corridor and to stop Line 3. And the people are fighting on the ground, literally chaining themselves to the machines. Over 250 people have been arrested at this point since December, arrested during the middle of a pandemic, climbing into pipelines, climbing into frozen tar sands lines, literally trying to fight for their lives, for their futures. So a really common perception of Native people is that we're people of the past, that we're the static footnote in history but we were here before the arrival of the United States. We were here before Canada, and we are still here today. Uh, there is this long dispossession of genocide and removal, and then there's like nothing after that. People seem to think that we didn't keep progressing after the 1800s. We, protect, we have to protect communities that are at risk, like my own. We are the people who are impacted first and worst by climate crisis, yet we are the people who often contribute the least to climate crisis. But then let's also talk about the justice component, because, you know, we we introduced the Green New Deal earlier this week. Um, and one of the topics that I had brought up is how the intersection of justice and the trampling of Native rights and environmental racism actually contributes and is a key element of, um, of fossil fuel infrastructure and climate change. Ms. Tara Hushka, we see the Dakota Access Pipeline We've seen what's happening with line three. And it seems as though there's this pattern of fossil fuel industries and fossil fuel pipelines intersecting with native land and treaty land. Is that a coincidence? The reality is, is that we're the places that are out of sight, out of mind. We are the last places, like I mentioned in my testimony, the last places holding the sacred. When they wanna put through a pipeline or through a mine or through some other extractive economy, they don't put that in a rich suburb. They don't put that somewhere that's gonna go through other people's land, it goes through ours. From beginning to end, we are the people that are desperately experiencing the impacts of not just the climate crisis, but of the actual building of infrastructure. That's where the sacrifice zones. Yeah, and in fact, in, that, in the case of um, the Dakota Access Pipeline, it was originally supposed to be constructed through a wealthier and whiter neighborhood. And that neighborhood organized and said, not in our backyard, put it over there. And that is what allowed the political, would you say that that's what uh, helped contribute to a political environment where it was easier to look away, where these fossil fuel pipelines were being struck, constructed in communities where it's look, easier to look away from? Although they're trying their hardest to look away and to not look upon our faces, the faces of the original peoples of this land, we are pushing back. Every single pipeline infrastructure project that's proposed has indigenous resistance to it. That's the reality of the situation. We cannot just pick up and leave. These are our homes. 